Hello again, homies. This is Sarah. And this is Ashley. And this is Hometown Homicide. We are back after me failing and taking a week off for issues because I have issues but we're back we're doing Ashley's normal episode and we'll also release a makeup episode of mine shortly and it feels like it's been like 84 years since I've been behind this microphone yes it it seems like very long time very long time it was only two weeks I know but we're here and we announced a winner tonight Yay. for the YouTube contest that we had. Um, that once we got 100 subscribers, um, How to Spot a Killer podcast was the winner. Um, posted that on Instagram and on Twitter. Someone thinks they're cool driving by. It's fine. I hate people. <laughs> I hate living here. I don't hate living here, but like... I've been here so long, I want to move, and everyone's leaving me. Thanks, Kara. <laughs> I need to start selling feet pics or something, just in, so I can afford something bigger. Yeah. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Anyway. Yeah, congrats to How to Spot a Killer, Lynette. You're the winner. Let us know where we can send the merch to. But what... Any news? Um, it was the... This is the headline. Indiana State Police identify the I-65 killer. Oh, yeah. After a 30-year investigation. Um, yeah, we were tagged. Yeah, Wendy. In it and, I used to work with her. Um, yeah, they identified, I'm assuming, through the whole um, familial DNA. I didn't actually even sit down and read it yet, but... Because he died in 2013, I thought I just saw somewhere, and now I can't find it. But they had, they, they identified, or you know, put a name and face to the, the murderer. So, you know, hey. And that kind of ties in what mine is about today. Oh. Because I love me a Oops. cold case turned into solved. And that's what I have today. <laughs> because. It was brought to my attention that this one was just solved last month after being cold for 40 years. Oh, dear. Yeah. So if we don't have any other news, then I will get into the cold case of Lee Rodatori. Lee was born September 29th, 1949 in North Dakota. She was the oldest of four. And she seemed to, like, live all over the Midwest. Um, Apparently, she grew up in Minnesota. She moved to Illinois. She lived in Wisconsin. Um, Before she lived in Michigan at one point. Lee was described as mostly happy and outgoing. An artistic woman with lots of friends. I guess she made friends everywhere she went. While growing up, Lee loved drawing horses, and then once she was an adult, was finally able to have her own horse. Uh, She attended the University of Wisconsin, getting her bachelor's degree in dietary services and a master's degree in food nutrition. Lee married Anthony Rodatori in Minnesota on November 14th, 1970. The couple had one son, Michael. They divorced in Illinois in September of 1977. She then married Gerald, or Jerry, Nemke, August 1978 in Wisconsin. The couple had no children, divorced in 1979, then remarried December of 1981. Okay. But she kept her last name, uh, Rodatory, for professional reasons and because she had an 11-year-old son who lived in Chicago with her first husband. Lee had worked as a regional dietitian for Unicare Health Facilities, a Milwaukee-based company that owned healthcare facilities in Wisconsin and a number of other states. Her work frequently took her throughout southern Wisconsin in the 70s, and in the early 80s, she worked in Michigan. 
And then in mid-June 1982, she left Michigan and traveled 617 miles to Council Bluffs, Iowa for a job as a food service director at Jeannie Edmondson Hospital. Lee checked into room 106 at the Best Western Motel that was close to the interstates of 80 and 29. Um, And she planned on staying there until her husband, Jerry, Mm -hmm. came down with her mobile home. Lee started orientation for her new job on Monday, June 21st. On Thursday that week, she went boating on Lake Manawa with friends she met at the hospital. After boating, Lee stopped at McDonald's to get some food and then went back on the interstate to head back to the motel. The next day, Friday, June 25th, Lee was found by a motel employee dead in her room on a blood-soaked bed with a single stab wound to the heart. Inflicted from the front, um, said that she may have been dead about 12 hours before her body was found. There was also evidence that her attacker sexually assaulted her. There were no signs of forced entry or any kind of struggle. Sergeant Larry Williams, who was one of the six detectives part of the investigation, told the Omaha World Herald that even though some of her items were missing, like her purse and some jewelry, robbery wasn't a motive, since the room wasn't torn apart like someone was looking for something, but they didn't have a motive. Mm -hmm. Like, that wasn't it, but there was no motive. With where the motel was located... Williams said that by the time the body was discovered, the killer could have been five feet away or a thousand miles away. Right. Just jump on the interstate and go anywhere. Mm. Now, you know when, like, you have a spouse that gets murdered? Obviously, the other spouse is the first looked at, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, they looked into her husband, Jerry. And this surprised me. Like, this one took me a while to wrap my head around because I thought it's said he was 17 at this time but so when lee's husband jerry when he was 17 so in the 60s Mm. because i'm like she's married to a 17 year old Uh that seems weird he was picked up in chicago for questioning in the starved rock illinois slaying of three chicago area women and the fatal beating of a young chicago waitress marilyn duncan Police seized Nemke while he was driving a stolen car in the northwest area where Marilyn Duncan, 16, was fatally beaten in April of 1960. According to a story published May 9th, 1960, Nemke later admitted that he assaulted and beat Duncan to death. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death in Duncan's murder. I'm sorry? Right. I was like, what? What? The Illinois Supreme Court overturned the conviction less than two years later, citing that the preliminary hearing wasn't conducted properly. Technicalities. Nemke again was found guilty a second time. Oh, okay. And sentenced to 75 years in prison. Mm -hmm. But he clearly didn't serve 75 years. Right. Um, He was free by the time... Lee was killed two decades later. But detectives investigating her death said he had a solid alibi and had moved on. So, unfortunately, the case remained unsolved for decades. Three organizations quickly stepped up to offer rewards for information leading to the arrest and indictment of the person or persons responsible for Lee's death. So, Edmonds Hospital, where she was working, like, had just started work, Mm -hmm. along with Service Master Inc. of Chicago... Um, looks like it was Lee's contract firm and actual employer. Um, both donated both donated one thousand dollars towards a reward fund by July fourth, nineteen eighty two. Kenseth Enterprises Inc., the owners and operators of the Best Western Frontier Motor Lodge, where she was killed, gave another one thousand dollars to the fund. The reward was unclaimed, and her murder remained unsolved. Hmm. Evidence collected in 1982 was submitted to the state crime lab for examination in 2001 and determined a male DNA profile, but there were no matches in state and federal databases. Uh The DCI lab would periodically check this unknown DNA over the years without ever getting any matches, but in April 2018, 
Council Bluffs investigators submitted the unknown male DNA profile to Paraben Nanolabs to begin a genetic genealogy case. In February 2021, researchers from Paraben and ES Gen... Gen- <laughs> Why? <laughs> don't know. Genealogy, who examined familial relationships, concluded that Thomas O. Freeman of West Frankfort, Illinois, was the source of the suspect DNA. Oh, like the middle initial is O? Yeah. Okay. Like Oscar. First, I was like, O. Freeman? That's a weird Irish kind of <laughs> name. And then I'm like, no. oh, yeah, I bet you mean O. Freeman, and I'm an Like idiot. Thomas Got Oscar <laughs> or Thomas Owen. Whatever. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Was a source of the suspect DNA. A sample of Freeman's daughter's DNA was analyzed by the Iowa DCI lab, which confirmed that there was a parent-child relationship between the DNA found at the scene of Lee's murder and Freeman's daughter. February 25th, 2022, Council Bluffs Police Captain Todd Wedham announced in a press release that police detectives had cleared the cold case homicide for Lee Rodatory. Hmm. According to police, authorities in Illinois on October 30th, 1982 discovered Freeman's decomposing remains hastily buried in a shallow grave just outside of Copton. It was determined that the then 35-year-old Freeman died after sustaining multiple gunshot wounds hmm. approximately three months prior to the discovery of his body. So... Hmm. He'd been there for three months. Mm -hmm. His killer has never been identified. And this happened four months after authorities allegedly say he killed Lee. Investigators with the Illinois State Police and detectives in Iowa are currently working on a joint investigation to determine whether Freeman's death may somehow be linked to Lee's murder. Freeman was a trucker and police believe he killed Lee while he was passing through the area. There is no known direct connection between them, but they also believe it's possible that Freeman and Lee's husband, Jerry, mm -hmm. could have crossed paths. Mm -hmm. Is it a coincidence that after prison, Jerry went to college in Carbondale, Illinois, which is about 15 miles from where Freeman's body was found? Jerry died in March 2019, and it said it's safe to call him a person of interest in the Freeman murder. But here's my thoughts on this. Mm. How would Jerry know who killed his wife? Like, he was in Michigan. She's in Iowa. Apparently, this dude, I mean, he's a trucker, but from Illinois. Mm. How would he know that this random trucker killed her and then went and killed him? I, that I don't get. So but my thought is... If they speculated that maybe they crossed paths, maybe Jerry hired him to do it, and it was going to seem very random, since he was a trucker, you know, whatever, like he wasn't from the area and stuff, and then Jerry killed him to get rid Who of knows? the evidence, or, you know, cover it up. Everyone took it to their grave, so. Tragic. But I just wanted to share that because... We started this whole podcast. My first one was another cold case solved after 40 years. Mm -hmm. 50 from, years. Was it 50? Mm -hmm. I. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. And so when this one came up that this one was solved because of DNA, I was like, we're going to do this one. Short and sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Well, neat. Yeah, it's good to have... To find answers, even though it's been years. So I'm wondering, like, if we're going to see more of this because... Of all the DNA stuff? Mm-hmm. Or and like the, family tree yep. stuff. I know and there's that. a good video on cbsnews.com mm -hmm. um, where the, this lady, like, this is what she does. She does the family trees to see where the DNA is from mm -hmm. to find... Murders. If you guys can hear that music, I apologize. Like, I'm not, I guess I don't need to apologize. It's not my fault that Ted Bundy below me. Yes, I call him <laughs> Ted Bundy because I swear he's so creepy. And he just, I swear to God, he kills people in his apartment. But for some reason, all of a sudden, it's super loud down there. Normally, don't. So he might be cutting someone up at this point. 
I like when he's at work, like I can hear someone banging in his apartment, like they're trying to ask for help, and then it'll be quiet for weeks, and then all of a sudden it happens again. It's like, does he bring random people over and kills them? I don't know. If he does, what does he do with them? <clears throat> Chops them up and he leaves for work at like 5 30 in the morning oh yeah but no one's found pieces of bodies around here how long did it take john wayne gacy to find all those bodies years and what about that dorothy lady who had all these bodies buried in her yard yeah he doesn't have a yard to bury him in though yeah he's probably taking him somewhere else i don't know ted <laughs> bundy <laughs> but anyways that's my little side piece <laughs> I wish I, I I need a side piece. <laughs> I need a main piece. <laughs> I was gonna say you don't have a piece. <laughs> oh man! Oh yeah. yeah. Forgot how to do this. <laughs> and thank you for um, Tony. Tony L. Maybe Tony L. One two three. Tony. Oh yeah. I'm like, who's Tony? But I got for it for the uh, five star review on Apple Podcasts. Appreciate Yay. you. Yeah, yeah. We try to keep it entertaining as much as we can. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel like something's always happening in my life. It's either really quiet or something's... Bonkers. Yeah, like mm. the fire. Yeah, the fire. Someone's moving into Jason's apartment. Do I scare them off now? <sighs> and be like, hey, you do know someone died in there and he did promise to haunt it. They're having trouble. Um, maintenance has been here and the lady manager. <laughs> um, they are, his garage is sticking. They can't get it open. Yeah. And the key, and Jason never had an issue. And that was like Jason's happy spot. He always is down there grilling so more if he's making it so they can't go in there. <laughs> Did you ever turn them in? No. I, 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 I don't want retaliation. I want to find something. I found a really awesome, amazing condo in um, Marion. Yeah. But it's like 1400 a month. Aye. So, I know I can't afford that. Um, who wants to buy some feet pics? <laughs> I'll sell them. Help me buy a condo. <laughs> well, despite our weak absence, but like I said, we're making it up to you here shortly. We put out, we put out episodes every Monday. So if you like our stories, you like our personalities and abantas, uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. and TikTok. Yes. All Hometown it. Homicide Podcast. Yes. And then Twitter. At Ope Murder. Ope Murder. Ope. Because hashtag Midwest. So. Oh, and Patreon. Patreon slash Hometown Homicide Podcast. I always forget about Patreon. Yeah, uh, come over. We did not have a bonus episode last month. Last month. It was just, and the end of the month was the same week that I was trying to use to get my episode ready, and I just was like, I don't even know, man. It doesn't really help either. The last, I think, three weeks, three and a half weeks has been oh, nothing shitty. but cold and rainy, yeah. and it's, seasonal depression is a real thing, and it's to the point where when I get off work, sometimes even while I'm working, I just want to go, like, lay down and go mm -hmm. to bed. I have no energy, and it's really getting old. Thunderstorms are great. The one night or whatever that there was thunderstorms a couple few weeks ago, it was awesome, but when it's just, yeah, cold and drizzly and gray out. It's depressing, and so. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had three people out sick on Monday, so I had to go into work and cover on Monday. So this was my sixth sixth day in a row working today. What if you had something planned? Like, what if you were out of I town? I could what? have said no, but I literally was at home and I was like, yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll go in and, and help. Because I, I love my manager, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> so she listens. But I'm okay. <laughs> Follow us. Rate us. Comment us. Love us. You can email us too. Yeah, have, email us. We have our email podcast at hometownhomicide.com. I want but. ghost stories. And I want true crime, real life from you guys' stories. But yeah, if you have a story you want us, us to things. cover, definitely send it over to us. I have a lot that I need to start researching. 
There is one I want to do from Davenport, Iowa, but I want to read the book, and the book's expensive. All right, well, remember that we want to tell stories to you and not about you, so stay safe. And this was Hometown Homicide. I don't know why I said it like that. Hey, <laughs>